and just reminded ourselves that we'll do it one step at a time. We had eight, we had given ourselves an eight month timeline to complete all the work that we had to do. So thankfully, our first project was just painting a unit, changing some handles, very basic stuff just to get our feet wet a little bit. Hello, and welcome to this week's episode of the Real Estate Investors Club podcast. This is our final episode where I speak to Stephanie, young investor, about the cover-to-cover -cover process of closing on a first 100% uh, purpose investment property. And today we're going to be covering everything that goes from the moment at which your ink hits the paper at the notary to the first month of ownership, which can be super anxiety provoking. So Stephanie, thanks for joining me. You want to give us just two lines like by way of introduction? Yeah. Thanks for having me again. Um, so like Terry said, this is my first real investment. I purchased a fourplex. And it's been quite the roller coaster. I've been learning a lot and I just wanted to come on the show to share my experience and give everyone else who's starting off the motivation to start their journey as well. Awesome. All right. So let's uh, go to the moment at which you're at the notary. So you sign. Um, lot, I mean, I, I remember from when I, I mean, my first notary, a lot of zeros more than a yearly salary. And I remember calculating exactly how many years it would take me to actually pay for this out of my own pocket and having a little bit of panic. So take me through those like first 24 hours, you're a new mom of a building and now yep. you're panicking. I actually have to take care of this baby. So tell me how, what that was like. Yeah. So just starting off, we ended up going with a notary and we did it virtually. And I was a little bit apprehensive about doing it that way, just because I felt like well, we're going to miss out on some information or it won't be as um, complete as we might want it to be, but actually ended up being fine. If anything, it was very uneventful. I stopped working for about 20 minutes and went back to work right afterwards. Um, but no, our experience was really good. Like I said, uneventful a little bit. We gave each other a high five. Me and my partner, Michael, we gave each other a high five right after we signed and got off the call. And kind of went about our day it was really strange. And it wasn't until that evening that we had gone to the building and did our first walkthrough. And it's so strange walking through a building and being, it just like sinks in and you're kind of in disbelief that this is yours. Like we're walking through these buildings, we have our own keys. And yeah, so it was a very strange experience. Um, and that disbelief kind of quickly turned into feeling overwhelmed because we were noticing all the projects that we had ahead of us. And we went home and basically had a sleepless night. We could not sleep. Um, <laughs> panic was one of the main emotions I remember feeling. Um, thankfully, we were both feeling it. So we were able to help each other. We got through it with a lot of self-talk, just countering the panic with just being proud of ourselves and having gone to this point and being happy and knowing and reminding ourselves that down the line it will pay off um but yeah that was the first night and i remember it dawning on me that a tenant can call me at any point about an issue and it just freaked me out because i felt like i i like gave away a bit of my freedom because now it's my responsibility for all the tenants that were living in the building. Um, yeah, that was the first night. Thankfully, we woke up fresh and ready to tackle the projects and just reminded ourselves that we'll do it one step at a time. We had eight, we had given ourselves an eight month timeline to complete all the work that we had to do. So thankfully, our first project was just painting a unit, changing some handles, very basic stuff just to get our feet wet a little bit. And yeah, that was pretty much it. Again, roller coaster of emotions, up and down, excited, scared, panicked, fearful, and just motivated to get continue. 
So tell me about the first week, because I think, you know, again, in, in the previous episode, we talked about the stuff that you don't know, right? So, yeah. you know, in the first week of ownership, like you have that, you know, first night or first few nights where like the it dawns on you that this is your responsibility, both financial and human. Um, but then there are some concrete steps that you have to take in terms of, you know, going, trying the keys, meeting the tenants, informing them that they now have to pay you the rent. Like, what were some of the concrete things that happened for you guys in that first week that you think it would have been nice if you knew ahead of time? Right. What I didn't realize is that you can't just show up at someone's door and say, hey, I'm the new owner pay me now because what's stopping anyone from walking on the streets to do that? Um, we actually had to contact the notary to give us an official letter that stated that we're the new owners, that our contact information. So it was an official letter that we had to show up and give to the tenants. And I had made a bit of a, a list to Michael. So I do more of the background work. Michael does more of the tenant facing work. So he did that walkthrough and he knocked on each of the tenant's doors, gave them the paper, answered any questions. He tested their fire alarms and just double checked that the keys work. Well, definitely we contacting, you know, hydro, um, school yeah. taxes, making sure that the utility companies and the city, if necessary, knows where to send any bills um, and the, that they, the accounts are in your name. Um, yeah. that's even something that as a seasoned investor, sometimes, you know, I'll forget to make one of those phone calls and then have a nasty surprise. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I think so in the previous episode, I had mentioned that I'd made a list of things that I wanted to do on the day of ownership and, um, following like whatever we had to do after ownership. And that was on there. So, um, I had spent a lot of time just mentally walking through the processes that might come up af after ownership so I did feel a little bit more prepared and that's why I did know to do that and it was just checked off my list of things that I had to do um that's probably why I'm not remembering it that well because I relied so much on that list and not so much on my memory um all I remember from that first week was just rushing to get the first unit turned over I thought it would take a weekend and obviously it didn't it didn't take a weekend. It took a week and a half, which isn't the end of the world, but goes to show that budget and timelines always, you have to account for an extra 10%, probably in our case, we tripled <laughs> all of it. But one of the mindset shifts that we had to do in that process of turning over that first unit was having to remind ourselves that this isn't my unit. I'm not going to live here and even though there was a ton of modifications that we would have liked to do to make it like tip top shape unit, we were constantly having to remind ourselves, is this modification going to maximize our rent? And I think it's just important to say that you need to do the minimum amount of work that will maximize your rent while making sure that your unit is well set up and safe for the tenant. I, I just want to take a, a moment to highlight that because I think, you know, you guys have learned that lesson very early in the process. There are some people who have been landlords for 10 years and when they face an empty unit or turnover, they're still thinking with their own lens. And so I'm just going to repeat what Stephanie said because I think it's super important. Like when you are looking at how to renovate your units, you're not renovating for you. You have to bear in mind what's the market willing to support in terms of, you know, are any upgrades going to actually pay you back in terms of return on investment? Obviously, cleaning up safety issues or like maintenance issues that are going to depreciate the building, that doesn't matter what the tenant's going to pay. That's protecting your investment long term. But any upgrades that are, you know, aesthetic or uh, functional in terms of like, you know, the tenant's quality of life in there, is the market willing to pay you an extra dollar for those modifications? And if the answer is no, well, you're actually not going to live there. So for your target clientele, is this going to make a difference in terms of your tenant pool? And if it's not, maybe you want to just cross that off the list and save some money. So yeah, one of an example that I can give is that half the unit had drop ceilings, the plafond flottant. And we were just curious. So we looked underneath and it turns out that it was just covering actual ceiling, like gyp rock. And we were like, we were so excited because we're like, it's hideous, but now we can fix it. And we just had to remind ourselves 
that's not in the budget right now, like we had already painted and redoing that would have cost time and money. And it's, we made a list of things that we wanted to modify next time we turn over the unit. So it's top of the list next time. But for now we realize that it's not going to bring us more money. It's just going to waste our time, um, time and money as well. So that was, that was pretty shocking discovery. And we really had to stay strong because had it been a unit that we would have lived in, it would have been, off the ceiling the moment we discovered it, but had to take a step back and yeah, we had our parents in the unit that day when we discovered and everyone was telling us, yeah, get rid of it, get rid of it. And that too was hard to do is to block out all the noise. Michael took me aside for a second and he was like, let's not forget what we're doing here. This is our unit and we just need to go back to the basics and remember that it's not gonna make us more money. So that to tune out everyone else who's making you second guess yourself and second guess your plan. Yeah. Or tune out the p unqualified people that you shouldn't yeah. be listening to. Cause I think yeah. like, you know, we've had off camera and on camera conversations about this. And like, obviously you don't wanna ignore valuable opinions or data that comes from a reliable source. But you know, um, if, especially when you're starting out very often people will have family members come and like help them paint and help them deal with various things. But like, if your family are not investors by profession or don't have extensive investment experience, don't let them talk out of things that you talk you out of things that you know are the right decision. And so like, you know, thankfully you guys were able to rely on each other and, and stay strong in that respect. But it's not that like, you should cover your ears and go la 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 <laughs> <laughs> to every every piece of data that comes in. It's just, you need to be aware that not everybody around you has the knowledge to have their opinion heated. Everybody has an opinion, but that doesn't mean that you necessarily have to listen to it. So I think that's another good point. Have you really been listening to the episode or has your monkey mind been taking you off in one direction or another? Our mental habits can be our biggest assets or our biggest liabilities as we pursue certain goals. For me, the biggest performance gains have always come from training my mind. In my book, Mindful Landlord, I talk about how you can train your mind and how you can apply some of these strategies to your journey in the real estate field. The book is available on Amazon and also on its website, mindfullandlord.com. Now I'll stop evangelizing for the power of mental training and let you get back to the show. Um, and so let me just extend that um, out a little bit. So it's been about a month since you guys mm -hmm. took over ownership. So you told me like a fair amount about the first week. Um, anything else that we didn't cover that came up kind of as a surprise or something that like, you know, now you're learning to live with this new responsibility in your life? Like, just tell me how that is. Um, okay, so a couple things. Um, first thing I want to say is that I think this phase of our journey has impose the biggest amount of imposter syndrome because going to networking events, I was fine to state that I was a newcomer, that I was going to be asking newbie questions. But at this point, you're going into your building and you're supposed to act like you know what you're doing in front of all your tenants. Like that's the biggest, like it, it just, I, I don't even know. Like when I face a tenant and I have to act like I know what I'm doing and when I really have no idea, that's that's scary. And we had a call the other day from a tenant at 9 a.m. on a Saturday morning saying that there was water leaking through her ceiling and it was coming out through one of the light fixtures. So we rushed over there expecting the worst. Thankfully, it wasn't too bad. But I remember I just have this shot of me and Michael standing on the tenant's table with a bucket holding up <laughs> catching all the water. I was holding the light fixture, tilting it to make sure that all the water would drain into his bucket. And the tenant was just standing there and we're supposed to act like we know what we're doing when we really don't. She probably has more experience with that than we do. So again, like this, the imposter syndrome was real. And yeah, that was one of our first unintentional headaches. And you just, you just have to roll with the punches kind of it, it was a stressful call and I don't want another one, but I know it's going to come. So as long as I'm preparing myself for the possibility of it happening again, then I'll be a little bit more prepared in the future. Um, something else that was unexpected was that um, the unit that we were turning over right next door was another one of our there was a tenant living in the unit right next door and she was having issues with her unit and we 
she kept on asking us, when are you going to fix this? When are you going to fix this? So what we ended up doing, we pitched the idea to her to take the unit that we had turned over and now we're redoing her unit. So that's another curveball a little bit because we had not planned on redoing hers. But if we were going to put in money anyways to fix the things that she was asking us to fix, then we might as well, might, might as well get more rent for that unit. Um, so that, again, a little bit about creating your own deals is we saw an opportunity and we put her in the unit. And I think at the end of the day, it definitely increased the value of um, – the building just because now we're getting more rent out of it and yeah we're still in the process of still fixing her unit um actually with her unit she had a, a leak in her shower and that's all we were planning on addressing but then I think one thing led to the next I I don't know if I'm the only one who felt into this trap but we're like oh we're doing her shower might as well take out the wall oh we're taking out the wall might as well take out the flooring and we're literally down to the studs right now and I don't know how we got here but we're here and now we have to deal with the situation and we're we're not contractors we don't know how how to do it so we've been relying a lot on YouTube and trying to do some of the fixes and I yeah I just don't know how to feel about this part because I feel like we've dug ourselves into a hole and I don't know Terry but have you done this before? Have you got yourself um, in this yeah. mess? <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, unfortunately, construction projects, especially, again, in, you know, poorly managed properties, it's a bit like pulling the thread on a sweater, right? Like you think, okay, let me just fix this plumbing problem. And then when you have the wall open, then all of a sudden you become aware, no, wait a second, actually the the tile is rotten because they didn't redo the grout and so now the wall is moving so like am i just gonna redo the tile um and, and then you take that out and then like oh hey hang on a second like the bathtub has this so should we just take out the bathtub and like it's a question of like now you're pulling on the thread and the whole sweater has un unraveled in front of you so I mean, look, you know, I don't I don't think I can give you a, you know, a blanket statement of like, OK, you know, always replace the wall, but don't fix the plumbing or <laughs> fix the plumbing and don't <laughs> replace the wall. You know, um, I think this is just like a question of getting a feel for your market um, of tenants, because not all markets have are need to be renovated to the same standard. So, you know, just very quick answer on on bathrooms like yeah, it, it, you can have to retile the whole thing. You can also do like this PVC covering called Bain Magic, which is actually much cheaper. Um, and you will learn that with time, right? Like, like you know, obviously at, at the beginning, I think people have a tendency maybe to over renovate because there are things that worry them um, that maybe you could get away with not replacing right away or you could do a cheap fix for and then sometimes they leave things undone that, that you actually should do when you have an opportunity to do it and I think that's just a question of experience and dollars thrown in the wrong direction and it, you know it's a learning process and you will eventually get the feel for the fact that the next time you take this over you discover a leak do we really want to bring the bathroom down to the to the studs um or is there a way to you know sort of cut corners and do it in a way that's cheaper and like maybe leave some of that stuff for a bit later on and uh, still ultimately provide something that's safe for the tenants and um you know is not spending money that's not going to bring you roi but yeah that's what i'd have to say about that okay yeah i feel a little bit like a hypocrite because 10 minutes ago i was just saying how in the first unit i was saying no to everything is it going to make us more money and now here i am down to the studs in the bathroom but it like you said it was a leak and we noticed that the wood was rotting so it was just this was a lot more um yeah no you got ner you got nervous about electrical concerns Concerns. No, you got concerned about the fact that like this might actually be depreciating your investment, right? Like that's not an aesthetic renovation that you're doing to make the tenant feel better, better about their unit. You're worried that like, is this leak actually going to somehow create a problem for us further down the line? And do we need to protect our investment by going the extra mile, yeah. getting rid of anything that could cause mold? Ultimately, it's a contractor who has the answer to that. But, um, you know, you're going to also develop a feel over time for what sort of renovations are like going a little. When are you overshooting the mark? When are you undershooting the mark? And like really, you know, I want to say property ownership is kind of forgiving in the sense that like it's not like you're going to make a mistake that you can't recuperate. At the worst case, you're going to have to pay an extra two, three, 
maybe four thousand dollars down the line because of a mistake you made but it's not existential it's something that's going to like affect your bottom line in the short term but it's just avoid the existential mistakes so okay (laughs) um i did want to say that since we did take ownership i've had these really big i've had this big fear that something major was going to come up and that it would cost like fifty thousand dollars to repair and i don't know if this is a fear I don't know. Did you have this fear when you took over ownership? I do find it dissipating a bit because I'm not so far haven't found anything that major, but it might still happen. So it's still at the back of my mind, but it's dissipated. Um, I was just wondering if you've experienced anything like that. Oh yeah. hundred percent. And like, you know, I, when I go back in my mind to like that for me, it was like the first year of ownership. And, um, you know, I was not in as solid of a financial situation as you guys are in. I was a student when I bought my first place and yes, my, you know, dad helped me co-sign the mortgage. Um, but it was like, I was not going to go back and knock on mom and dad's door and ask for money. So for me, uh, you know, having a, a vacant unit, that I knew I couldn't cover on my student's salary at that time, which was kind of non-existent. Like there was no, I could not cover that mortgage by myself. So, you know, for me that generated in, the lack of income generated like very sleepless nights. And then uh, I also had that feeling of like the ceiling is going to fall in. There's going to be vis cachet. There's going to be some terrible existential thing that's going to end up costing way more than I can handle. Um, and that moment actually never came. And you know, if I can maybe provide some reassurance of what I see, you know, across the investors I coach, the market that I work in, those existential in residential real estate, those existential crises that can wipe you off the map really are very, very unlikely. And chances are the way that they might materialize are not maintenance issues that you weren't expecting. Like those kind of things end up being stuff that you can see coming or that's going to affect your bottom line in a, in a bad way by pissing away profit in a niggling way. The places where I've seen people have existential problems, there, there are two places and I will mention them just, you know, by, by word of caution. One is at the time of sale, if you are not very vigilant about selling and having latent defects, like I've seen horrible latent defect cases after a sale come back to bite people. And so you have to really think long and hard. Do I want to sell with legal warranty or without legal warranty? Um, that's not exactly where you guys are, but that's a question that comes up, you know, in terms of massive lawsuits that could come back and bite you five years after you've liquidated the property. So that's definitely something to think about. Um, And the other thing is, you know, being very vigilant about how you do your maintenance in terms of the people you hire and um, does everybody have their construction cards? Because with time, you will notice that there are certain things where, you know, you you can repainting a unit, um, doing some gyp rock, doing minor plumbing repairs. Like you can probably get away with doing those yourselves or like having someone unlicensed handle some of that. But when you're doing serious renovations, you need to be really careful about people having proper insurance and proper cards. And I'll just tell you like one very quick story that's going to illustrate this. Like, um, you know, about 10 years ago, I hired a contractor to replace some balconies. And when they were replacing the balconies, two of his workers took a tumble off of the um, spiral staircase that led up to the third floor. The staircase detached itself from the building, fell on the guys, One of them got his hip crushed. The other one had a broken leg. Um, And thank God it was a licensed contractor. Thank God I had all the documentation, um, you know, that backed me up. So none of that ended up on me. But if you had someone, some handyman doing this and some terrible thing happens, um, you're basically going to find yourself in the middle of a very unpleasant lawsuit. And so you just need to be aware that like when you're contracting out work, um, specific kinds of jobs where there's a chance of either there being major building damage or where somebody could get seriously hurt going up on roofs, replacing balconies, things like that. You need to be really careful about hiring people who have proper licenses and proper insurance. Um, So, you know, if I can bookend it with that, I think, you know, major problems having to do with insurance or unlicensed work, like this is something that a lot of people don't take as seriously as they need to take. And that's existential. Whereas Mm -hmm. like something coming out of the blue, like lightning is going to strike your building and it's going to burn down. I mean, you have insurance for that. 
And that's the, the, the purpose between being sandwiched between the, you know, residential rental board on the one hand, because it's not true. Like we're not in the U S right. Like there's tenants are not going to come back with like massive $2 million lawsuits. And if they do, you have your insurance, they're protecting you. So okay. like nothing's going to, it's not a commercial lease. Nothing's going to come at you out of left field from the tenant department in terms of liability. Um, and then in terms of maintenance issues, you did your inspection. Like if some, you know, God forbid unforeseen horrible event happens, you have your insurance and you have insurance to cover that. So okay. ultimately like, you know, you might, your bottom line might not be as juicy as you hope that it would, but in terms of it wiping you off the map, I've actually never seen that happen in the way in which you're afraid of it. Okay. But that definitely caused me a lot of anxiety in my first year of property ownership. Okay. <laughs> Ooh, some weight lifted off my shoulder. Okay. Yeah. I feel a little better. Okay. Um, all right. Well, Stephanie, we're just, we're almost about to be out of time. So I don't know if you wanted to maybe by way of conclusion of the mini series, if you had any kind of like closing thoughts or anything that you wanted to like impart to our audience before we log off. Yeah. So I just wanted to reiterate that this process is quite an emotional journey with a lot of ups and downs. And I've shared with you my journey, but that doesn't necessarily mean that your journey would look the same. Um, and I think it's important to celebrate the small wins because sometimes there's some bad stuff that happens and you need to have some source of happiness at the end of the day, even if it's, I don't know, just installing a piece of jet rock or painting a bathroom or something as simple as that, because we need those. We need to stay positive and practice your emotional intelligence. I read a book called Emotional Intelligence 2.0 by Travis Bradbury and Jean Greaves. And it helped me a lot just with emotional awareness and emotional management. And I think that can really help um, propel us through this journey because it's not an easy one. And I don't know, this is not feeling like passive investment. <laughs> this very much feels active. Um, maybe one day I won't feel that way, but it is, it is a lot of work and you have to be in it for the long game because like I said, it's challenging. There's a lot of things that you're not going to think of that, that are going to come up, but I'm glad to hear that nothing major will take me down in my path because that was a huge fear. Um, yeah, just find the motivation that you need to get to the next step put yourself in situations where it's hard to turn back and escape from. And um, if you notice your motivation dying out, go out there and find it again. Because like I said, it's a, it's a roller coaster and you need uh, you need the motivation to get you to the next hill. Yeah. 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 No, that's absolutely. That's I, I, I love, I love, I love that that's where you ended it. And I'm going to just like, just like highlight two things you said, I think super important to celebrate the small wins. And, you know, if it's, you know, the point at which I am where, you know, like I, I sell a building or I purchase something new, or I take another step that for me, it's, it's kind of becoming more like another day at the office, but it is still a win. And like, you know, if you're, if you're selling, if you're buying, take the time to like, you know, go to a nice restaurant with, on the night that you close, just do something to make sure that you're associating that step with pleasure and a little bit of, um, you know, patting yourself on the back. Because if you don't take that time to, you know, be happy and celebrate the wins, you, the losses will get you down. So make sure that you're building in time to, to celebrate the wins. And then also just be, you know, clear about the fact that like on any journey that's difficult and any growth journey, be it in real estate or anything else is going to be a difficult path up the mountain, right? Like climbing a mountain is not an easy thing. And so there's going to be setbacks along the way. And to the extent that you can roll with those, celebrate the wins, um, something, you know, when you're standing at a higher vantage point and you look back at the stuff that you went through, like you're going to be happy that you kept climbing. So yeah. Yeah, it's true. And even if you do decide to stop, like you'll be further ahead than where you were before. So that's motivational as well. Yeah. And the, the that journey of personal growth, that is kind of how that works, right? Yeah. Like even if eventually you decide to change course, um, you used your time in order to like to expand yourself as opposed to shrinking away from a challenge. And that 
methodology, that mindset that you can use to face challenges is applicable across whatever sphere of life you might want to apply it to. So even if you practice it in one sphere and then try to import that somewhere else, um, it's definitely a process that you can scale out. Right. Yeah. Never time lost. Yeah. So Stephanie, thank you so much for taking the time to share uh, with our audience, talk, talk about your experience and like really break things down to, you know, the level where like a lot of people are starting out and just going through this experience for the first time. I think that's super valuable. So thank you. Thank you for letting me share my story. I appreciate it. And for all your wise comments. <laughs> so you. Um, listeners, if you found this constructive, if you got value out of it, please share it. Please, you know, shoot me and Stephanie uh, some feedback. I know we would both love to hear from you. Um, all right. And join us next week for another episode. Thank you. Thank you.